Mike is awesome. <laughs> so on the website, it had you graph some of the problems. It had you graph the Cartesian coordinate. And it's supposed to you're supposed to use the Cartesian graph to help you graph the polar graph. But I know a lot of people didn't understand how to do that. And so seeing if that was one of one of the ones that you were worried about. Okay, who'd like to start us off with a prayer? There's only two more opportunities. Thanks, Christian. I quit, quit just trying to get a handle on what you, what you might be struggling with. I'm sorry, I should not have written that in text, green color. But it's what you get today, I guess. Um, looks like we're almost tied between C, D, and then B's a little bit back. But, so. but C and D are connected, so looks like that's what we're going to focus on. Okay. Um, just a few general things. Um, so, just a few general things about polar coordinates. Polar coordinates are really nice when you have a natural center to the phenomenon that you are uh, that you're modeling. Okay, some things. In, in that are really hard to do in Cartesian or just more complex in Cartesian are relatively simple or super simple in um, modeling them in polar coordinates. So for example, um, x squared plus y squared equals 4. What's that the graph of? Circle with radius 2. Okay, there. Circle of radius 2, very simple in polar coordinates. So, um, so these are just some examples. We're going to run through really quick of where you might have natural centers. I'm not saying these are all of them. Uh, microphones, you have a natural center. They actually create microphones to have certain pickup zones, pickup areas. Um, and uh, they have different shapes. They're, these are shapes are modeled um, with polar coordinates. Um, so here's an, here's an extended mic right there. Um, that's a theta squared model, actually, that, that blue outline there. Uh, this is a bidirectional mic. When you're doing an interview, you, don't want it, you want a mic that'll pick up both of you sitting right across from each other. So that's what that one is. Um, uh, this is about pollution, uh, concentration in a city, depending on a weekday versus a weekend. And so you're, you're, you care about the middle of the city and, and which direction you're facing, kind of like to model the model the city area. It shows you where the where the um, pollution is. Um, some I've seen things like this where it actually they that what the angle is actually the wind direction, and so they actually pick up the the. You get, a, you get an idea of what, where the pollution is coming from, depending on the wind direction. And you can understand that that's, that makes a much more natural, that's a phenomenon with a natural center, because you're thinking about which direction the wind is coming from, from the center of the city. Um, poles, literally poles there, like the polar jet and stuff like that. Um, a lot of things in nature, so spirals, are they're really nice to model. They're not even functions in terms of can't do them as a function of y is a function of x, so they're nice to have something else. Um, antenna, you're where you're, how you 
uh, your pickup strength from an antenna. Uh, just a picture of some other natural center things, so flowers. Here you have the, a fern growing, galaxies. Uh, this is a staircase, snail, storms. This is disparity tuning characteristics of neuronal, res neur neuronal response to dynamic random dot stereograms in whatever that is, visual area V4. So I don't know what it is. They were, they were testing st cells, but, but you can see the polar graphs that they're using here to, uh, to represent the data that they have. So. And things that spin, a lot of things that you have that spin, they're modeled because you have a natural center. They are modeled um, uh, with polar coordinates. Um, this is another academic journal had to do with something with cardiac output. So you can see the polar coordinates there. Um, this is something that spins here. Anyone know what this is? This is in your car. What did you say? It's a camshaft. Yep, it's the shape of the cams. So the camshaft in your car lifts and puts down your valves to allow your gas mixture in and your exhaust out at certain times. So, and most importantly, tie-dye t-shirts. So I brought my tie-dye t-shirt today. So you have the, so here you go. I actually made, I actually made this tie-dye t-shirt. So, yeah, we'll talk more about We'll talk more about tie-dye t-shirts next time uh, and the spirals on tie-dye t-shirts. So, but, um, okay, that's enough general stuff. What was that? The naked tie-dye t-shirt. Um, that would be really cool. So, yeah, that would be really cool. Um, So I'm going to put up two points here. I want you guys to plot these. Okay. So plot those points. Oh, yes. Dang. I do that all the time. It's it's much more natural for me to do it this to do it the other way. <laughs> Did the same thing in my last class. Gives you more time plotting those points. Snap if you need more time. Okay. So while they're finishing plotting those points, um, when we graph an xy coordinates, our input tells us how far over or where we are in the x direction, and our output tells us how far up or down, so in the y direction. So um, how far over, how far up? Those are the those are the way we get our coordinates, that's the way we think about them. When we're doing polar coordinates, we think about these in a different way. We, um, you ask yourself, how far around so this is theta, how far around and then the R is how far out. Okay, so because that's easier for me to think about how far around how far around are we, you know, which direction we're facing, and then how far out, I tend to write 
that's why I make mistakes like writing the, the points as theta r instead of r comma theta. So, all right, so let's, let's graph these points. Two comma pi thirds. How far around are we? So here's pi thirds, 60 degrees, right? And how far out? We're out at a radius of two, so right there. So how about four pi thirds? Well, if there's one pi thirds, two pi thirds, three pi thirds, four pi thirds. There's four pi thirds. How far out are we? Negative two. But we're facing in this direction. What do I do with a negative two? I go backwards. So where do I end up? The same spot. So the same spot. So that's, that's one of the things that makes polar card coordinates a little bit more difficult is we have ways to write the same point that look quite different. Um, if, I, if you want to be at a, a point in Cartesian coordinates of 5, 6, your x coordinate has to be a 5. But in polar coordinates, if you want to be at a 2 comma pi thirds, your theta does not have to just be pi thirds. It could be pi thirds plus, plus however many two pi's or pi's you want. So and you might end up there. So, okay, so how far around and how far out? That's the, the way we think about plotting these. Um, Oops. So I'm going to put a graph. I'm going to write one down here. And I'm going to plot just y of theta on the Cartesian coordinate system. And, and I want you guys to try to graph the polar coordinates, and we'll talk about the connection between these. You do not have to use the Cartesian graph to help you out if you don't, don't want to, but I will talk about how you can use it. So one thing you can always do to plot one thing you can always do is just start plotting points. So you could always just start making, oh, here's, a th here's my theta, what's my r going to be? And you can just plug in thetas and get out r's. So you can always do that.
Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and start graphing mine. So I started to, I plugged in five different thetas. Uh, I went for theta equals zero, pi fourths, pi halves, three pi fourths, and pi. So, so when theta is zero, I get a radius of two, so I'm right here. The other way to think about this is I'm on, a, I'm on the circle that has a radius of two, and then your theta tells you how far, where you are on that circle, how far around to go. You don't have to start with theta. You can start with a circle of radius two. It's easier for me to think about thetas first, especially when you're dealing with negative radii. Uh, what's a circle of radii negative two? So, anyway. Um, so pi fourths, if I plug in pi fourths, I get one plus the square root of two over two. The square root of two is about 1.4. So you cut that in half, you get about 0.7. So I get one plus 0.7. So I'm out of here somewhere. Then at pi halves, I'm straight up, I'm at one. And then three pi fourths this direction, I'm at uh, about 0.3. And then I'm at zero. when I'm facing towards pi. So facing this this direction there. So so I can see part of this. Okay. Now we can use the graph of the Cartesian uh, the Cartesian graph to help us out. One, this already tells us all the relationships between theta and and uh, our inputs and our outputs. So all of these distances here, these y distances, all of those are just radii distances. So I can see, hey, at the beginning, I'm going to be out 2. At pi, I'm going to be out 0. And this shows me how, that, how it's going to, uh, at least somewhat, what the shape's going to look like. As I rotate from 0 to pi, I'm going to start at 2, and I'm going to go down to 0. Okay, So it tells me, uh, like qualitatively, what my what my graph might look like. There's also something else about this graph. It's symmetric about about pi. So so as I go up, here let me get a different. If I go the same distance from pi each way, my radii will be the same. So if I'm down here at this direction, then I better be out the same as this one. And going down this way, so 90 degrees up, 90 degrees this way, I had a pi halves, 90 degrees this way, I better, I have to be out the same thing. So my graph will be symmetric or around that angle, y equals pi. So not y equals, theta equals pi. So. So if you, if you have the graph, you can start reading off the points just from the graph, and you can start to get a feel for how, the, how the, the, your output, your radii, are going to change for your different angles. Okay? Um, this, uh, this shape has a name. It's called a cardioid. Why is it called a cardioid? Because it has a heart shape, right? C cardioid, cardiac, right? So... Um, so, so, like one plus or minus sine or cosine. These will all be cardioids. Okay. So, so now that we've done that much. What will what will r equals one of one plus sine of theta look like? So you don't have to start graphing it if you don't want to, but if you can start thinking about it and thinking about how the graph of one plus cosine theta will change if it's one plus sine of theta, that can might be able to help you out a lot. So think about that.
Right, anyone got some insight for us here? How can we think about one plus sine of theta? We don't think about one plus sine of theta, I guess. How can we, is there a way to think about this that would make it easy to graph? If we know it should look like the one, in some ways, the same shape as the cardioid one plus cosine of theta? Okay, so the the uh, the two curves here. The red is one plus cosine of theta, and the black is one plus sine of theta. They're just shifted. So if if I take the red, which way do I shift it? And how far to get the black? I have to shift it this way. How far? Pi halves. Okay. So on the polar on the polar coordinate system, which way is rotating pi? If I'm adding pi halves to theta, which direction am I moving? Turning left. So my red. If this was the this was the cosine one that we ended up with. Where will the where will the sign be? It'll be like that. So another way to think about that is where is sine of theta the largest? At pi halves. That's going to be the that's going to make my largest output. That's when the radius is the largest is at sine of pi halves because that's when sine is 1. So then I can get my radius of 2. That's the largest a cardio this cardioid ever reaches out. So I can I know that at pi halves I'm going to have my furthest out there. And when is 1 plus sine of theta the smallest? Well that's when sine of theta is a minus 1 which is at 3 pi halves and so it's going to be pointing the other direction. So that gets you here, let me trace that out with green. Okay. All right, let's do another one. Or any questions about that? Okay. All right, graph this one. R equals theta over 2 pi.
Okay. So I started putting down uh, graph, uh, making the list of points with my theta and r. So I could start plotting those. When I'm looking, this is theta equals zero over here. So when I'm facing that direction, I have a radius of zero. When I'm face, facing in pi fourths, I'm out how far? An eighth. Let's zoom in here. That's even too far for an eighth. That's probably still too far. And then a fourth when I'm heading up, and then three pi fourths, I'm at three eighths, and then I'm at a half facing that direction. Oh, dang it. Should have really zoomed in here. What, and what seems to happen? Every time I move around 45 degrees, how far do I go? My radius increases by an eighth. So, so if I go around every time, and pi fourths is how much of a circle? 45 degrees is how much of a circle? An eighth of a circle. So every time I go around an eighth of a circle, I go out an eighth. So um, if you did this with degrees, then, then it, you would have theta over 360 degrees. So, um, so I add another eighth down here. I add another eighth down here. Add another eighth out here. I add another eighth, and then that's eight eighths. I'm back to here. I'm I'm at the I'm at this point, zero comma one. Well, one comma zero, or one comma two pi. And then I can keep on going. So I go around an eighth of a circle, I add an eighth. I go around another eighth, I add an eighth. I go around another eighth, I add an eighth. Out here I'm at a half, one and a half. Add an eighth, add an eighth. Add an eighth, add an eighth. So what's happening here? You get a spiral. This is a special kind of spiral called an Archimedean spiral. I don't know if that's an I or an E. So, Archimedean spiral. So, in an Archimedean spiral, Okay, not drawn well, but the distance at any point between these bands, that distance is always the same, okay? So if you imagine taking up, the image I have is taking up one of those blue foam camping pads and you roll it up and you look at the end, like that foam pad stays the same width as you go around, that's an Archimedean spiral, okay? Um, here, let's go to Desmos. So in Desmos, oh, let me talk about just graphing first. Um, if, you want, if you want to make it easier to graph, you might want some polar grid paper. So if you just Google polar grid paper, then, um, oops, I only clicked on that. That you didn't want to do. So, uh, so you can get polar grid paper, it has the common angle measures, and then it has the radii, and it makes it a lot easier to graph. Um, while I'm on here, I forgot to, to talk about this. Do you guys know where to find the, the old final exams to review for the final? I meant to talk about this at the very beginning of class. So if you go to the math department website, so that's math.byu.edu, or if you just Google BYU math department, you'll find their website. And then you go to undergrad, so undergraduate, courses and previous exams, and previous exams. Then you can just go down to 113. Okay, and they have like 12, 12 old ones. 
Uh, you will find some content that won't be on our, the, our exam. If they have like hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine problems, we don't have, require you guys to know those anymore. Uh, probability, uh, stuff from the probability section 8.5. And even though we covered centroids, there will not be centroids on the final exam. So if there are centroid problems, you don't have to worry about those. Okay. Um, and because the finals, like this week, you should try to do as many of these as you can. So. Oh, you can use centroids. Yep. So. Okay. So I forgot to get that at the beginning of class. Okay. So on Desmos, if you want to... Um, Desmos usually looks like this. You've got the Cartesian grid. But if you want to change it, you can go to the, to the little wrench up there in the right-hand corner. And then you can, on the grid, you can click on the polar one. Okay. And then if you if you plot if you do like f of f equals x squared, it doesn't think about it in terms of polar. So if you want to graph polar coordinates, you have to use r and theta. Okay. So um, so r equals and you just type in the word theta t h e t a, and when you get to the end, it will it will turn it into the symbol. So there, I just graphed. I did r equals theta divided by 2 pi. And that's what we just tried to graph. So there is our Archimedean, our Archimedean spiral. So here you can more easily see that the, distance, that the distance out is the constant between these. Right now, every time you go around, you go out 1. So I'm at 1, I'm at 2, I'm at radius 3, I'm at radius 4. So, okay. Questions? Yes. On polar? I mean, on Desmos? I don't know. I don't know if it does parametric. Um, so, what do you do? Uh, so just do like x squared comma uh, x cubed. Okay, that didn't work. We'll try to figure out. I know how to do it in GeoGebra. So, um, but polar is a little easier here than in GeoGebra. GeoGebra, you make polar curves by making them parametric curves, which is really easy. We'll talk about next time. But, so, all right. Um, so this is a curve. This is r equals s sine of theta. Right now, s is 1. So um, so if I'm pointing out, man, I wish you could write on the screen. <laughs> if I'm at theta equals 0, what is sine? This is really just sine of theta, because s is 1 right now. So if I'm pointing out this direction, at theta, at theta equals 0, what's my radius at? There. Now, uh, 
I'm not a liar. It goes 0 to 12 pi. Okay? But I still get the same graph. What's going on? That's right. As sine goes past pi, I get at, if I go at 5 pi fourths, so 45 degrees past here, sine is negative square root of so, so which where, where am I plotting my point? I have to go back here. I have to go back, back this this way. And now I'm down here. What's at three pi halves? What sign? It's a negative one. So I'm plotting this point. So as I go, as the theta goes around one whole time, 360 degrees, it actually traces up the circle twice. So, so what I'm going to do? I'm going to. Um, I'm going to change, move the slider to s equals two. So it'll be sine of two theta. And I want you to think about and then talk to your neighbor about what do you think the graph will look like. Okay. So take a minute, think about that. You can start plotting points if you want. Okay, you can think about the Cartesian graph if you want to help you out. Okay, we're ready? So those of you that you're reading, you might know what, what happens here. Um, it's going to do some weird, it's going to do some fun stuff while I drag this to two. Um, I couldn't get it to jump automatically. But yeah, that's kind of cool. A little more, there we go. Uh huh. So if it's in sine of two theta, I get uh, these petals. Okay. I get these petals. I get four of them. What's going to happen when I'm at sine of three theta? So tell your neighbor. What do you think it's going to look like? I like that one. If we're back down to 2, 0 to pi actually only traces out 2 of the petals. Um, you can think about which 2. So I start off here at 0. Okay. Um, by the time I get to pi 4, where am I? Sine of... Yeah, so when sine is 2, I'm looking at sine of 2 theta. So by the time I get to um, pi fourths, I'm looking at the sine of pi half, and I'm at one. So, and by the time I'm at pi half, my output is the sine of pi, so I'm at zero. And then, and then if I go to sine of, 
another 45 degrees, so that's three pi fours. I'm at a minus one. And then sine of pi, I'm back to, uh, I'm, I'm at, when I'm at pi, I'm evaluating sine of two pi, so I come back over and I'm back to the middle. So I trace out these two petals. Is it by the time I'm done pi. And, and as I go around again, I trace out these two. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen at 4? Those are 8. And a 5? Six. Those are 12. Okay. And I can just hit animate and it'll do a lot of cool fun things. It's not showing you the all of these graphs, by the way, because it only goes to 2 pi. Some of them, if you kept going, it would fill out even more. So, okay, that's your fun thing for the day. Oh, there's a sign of a negative 0.2 for you. Okay. Um. Pull out that. Yeah, you don't have to do it with an iPhone. Questions? Or how do we do at answering your... The things you were struggling with. We've got a few minutes. We've got questions. What do you mean? I like the cardioid, the rose petals. They do a lemosome. So. Oh, okay. So let's think, let's think, what's going to happen is I, if I just add a constant to my, my radius, everything's going to move out by that one. Well, it could move out, out, but out might be in. Right? See, if I have, if I'm at this point, but I'm facing this direction, but I'm at this point because I got a negative value, and I added some. It's actually going to move it, that way. so it's, it's moving it out in some sense, in the positive direction along whatever vector you're facing. So yeah, so it will move things out um, in that sense. So there, that looked like it moved things out, didn't it? Let's get to. That's sine of zero. I just get a radius of two. Does it stay that way? Nope. So this is um, kind of like a cardioid. It will be a cardioid if this is one. Okay. But if I if I if I move all of those out one, I will no longer have that cusp. That cusp should be at one out, right? And then three. So it's going to keep moving things out. Um, what if I subtract a half? Yeah. I think it's what they call the a limosone in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here you can see where these things are negative. Here and here, here they were negative. They were adding some. Uh, yeah. But these, we were pointing up here. Have a great day. One more day left of lecture.